as I was revisiting some of the notes and the research, I thought, Lord, refresh some of these things that we have, we thought we, we kind of got them the first time. How many know that sometimes when you take a second or third look, you see something you never saw before? Yeah. Amen. So I'm going to read from Matthew 26, verses 38 through 44. And then I want to just want to pick up on a, a few key things that have to do with where Jesus suffered along the way. Every drop of his blood, by the way, folks, every drop of blood. There was not one ounce of Jesus' blood that was shed for nothing. It was not shed for dramatic effect, but to effect a full measure of grace, deliverance, and redemption as it relates to everything that we experience, Jesus suffered for us first. Then he said to them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. This is as he's on his way to Gethsemane. My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. So tarry here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and he prayed saying, oh father, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he comes to his disciples and finds them asleep and says to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me just one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O Father, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away, and he prayed a third time, saying the same words. Luke 22, verse 39. And he came out and went, as he was wont to do at the Mount of Olives. And his disciples followed with him. Verse 40 of chapter 22. And when he was at a place, or at the place, he said to them, Pray that you enter not into temptation. Now, this is repetition, but I want you to see there's a reason that I'm emphasizing these different accounts from the Gospels. And he was withdrawn from the about a stone's throw and kneeled down to pray. Now, we just read that in that Matthew account that Jesus went a few, uh, a little farther. He went with his disciples and he went a little farther away. And I, I'm always caught by this, is that he, in his agony, fell on his face. He literally collapsed in the agony of what he was going to experience and what he began to experience. And he was withdrawn then from about, uh, he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. And he kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared unto him an angel from heaven strengthening him. And he, being in agony, prayed even more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And then the account of... (coughs) The scourging and the beating that Jesus took is found in Matthew, or John 19, verses 1 and 2. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. And you saw that depicted so vividly a moment ago in the video there. I was caught by this as well. 22 of Luke, verses 63 through 65, says, And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And with many other things, blasphemously, they spake against him. I want to, first of all, have you imagine, and I don't even know that we could imagine this, because I tend to think we... We think that the real impact of Jesus' death was the physical suffering. Now, he suffered, in fact, he suffered more than any man. There's two scriptures, or one scripture, but I'm going to read from two different translations. But um, the beating that he took, it was not some glorious thing that you would see. In fact, the Bible says this, and I'll come back to this later. 
Many people were shocked. This is Isaiah 52, 14. Many people were shocked when they saw him. His appearance was so damaged, he did not look like a man. His form was so, his form was so changed, they could barely tell that he was human. That's from the New Century Version. And the New International Reader's Version says, many people were shocked when they first saw him. He was so scarred that he no longer looked like a person. His body was so twisted that he did not look like a human being anymore. So, let me touch on this first of all. When Jesus is in agony, when he starts realizing, and by the way, he knew weeks before his day was coming that he was going to face the cross. It's interesting, and I don't have time to deal with it this morning, but on his way to the cross, he stopped and ministered healing to people on his way. That's how totally committed he was. Though he was going to take on the world's sin, he was not in too big a hurry to stop and lay his hands and heal people on the way to the cross. But I want you to imagine for a moment, he who, know, who, he who knew no sin is now facing a cup in which he is, the scripture talk, talks about the fact that he drank the dregs of it. In other words, he, he drank the fullness of what that cup, that cup had to do with the sin and sins of you and I. Imagine having never known what we understand as sin. Are you with me this morning, by the way? Having never known what we have known, and here's the Son of the living God who's gone through every trial we could have ever gone through, yet without sin. Now he faces that moment that he's going to drink of a cup that he has never, ever tasted. He's taking on himself completely, completely all of our sin, sicknesses, and shame. The agony of the cup was the sins and the separation from God. When you hear Jesus cry, Father, forgive me. I'm sorry, when you hear him cry, he's saying, Father, why have you forsaken me? There was that moment in which Jesus was alone. In fact, the other agony of Gethsemane was that he asked his disciples, a couple of them, to go with him. Many followed, but he took two with him and said, just stay here with me and pray. And his grief became so great that he, that, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, when you didn't really, you wanted someone with you, but in that moment when that grief begins to come on in so strong that he, almost like when you're getting ready to get sick and you don't want anybody to be around to witness it, he lunges forward a few feet further and falls on his face in utter agony, crying out to God. I want to tell you something. The Bible says in the days of his flesh, he offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. And God heard him in that he had a reverential awe and feared the Lord. And though he was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. His agony and prayer, the earnestness of it. I know that... Uh, some of you have probably heard that there is such a phenomenon that there can be such an agonizing and intensive effect on the body that literally you can burst capillaries in your face and around your eyes and your blood and sweat will be mixed. That's how we can't even sometimes imagine. I remember, I know about that because one time I got so sick that in my <clears throat> ejecting things from my body, I nearly lost consciousness. In fact, I did at one point lose consciousness, but literally my, my blood and sweat was mixed together because of the intensity of the excruciating. That was from sickness. Jesus faced all this because of his agony in taking on your sin and my sin. Great drops of blood falling to the ground. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people and then this is what the scripture says. Think about this. And then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle for sin or against sin. So what do we learn about this? This picture of Jesus' agony is, is the struggle with the human soul. See, Jesus was the son of God, but he was also the son of man. So he experienced the stuff that you and I experience. That's what makes him a perfect savior. Because he knew it wasn't just an act. It wasn't drama. It was reality that he took upon himself. Everything that broke us, that defeated us. 
We learn from this that there is a grace to overcome the weaknesses of our flesh and accomplish and to accomplish the surrender completely to God's will. You know, one of the reasons why, by the way, Gethsemane, by the word Gethsemane means the oil press. Gethsemane was around an olive uh, vineyard where the olives were pressed till the olive oil was taken out. Here's Jesus literally being squeezed by all eternity with what he was experiencing to take on our sin and our sicknesses. By the way, we must learn from this that the will of God is accomplished first as you and I are on our knees. Don't expect to know or to do the will of God short of the habit of prayer and of the word of God. Even in the most difficult times when you have to make a decision about something with regard to the will of God, that you'll never know how to really make that decision outside of those moments when you grieve and say, Lord, I don't understand, but nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Have you ever been there? Think about it. Have you ever been there? I know that in the midst of the darkest times of my struggles, I can count on this one thing, that there is still unbroken communion because of what Jesus did in Gethsemane, that we now have access by the blood that Jesus shed, even in the garden while he was in prayer. Blood gives us access to the throne of God, Hebrews 10 says. Our sins and iniquities, he says, I will remember no more. And having therefore, brethren, boldness, we enter into the very holiest because of what Jesus has done. Let me talk a little bit about the scourging. There's three things that, that, around this particular thing that happened, the scourging, the mocking, and the crown of thorns. I, I don't know if there's anything that is, if you can imagine anything being more humiliating or um, trying than to be going through a thing where, where there's such disrespect and such hatred and such a despising that you feel the, the full impact of not only the outrage, but the humiliation. Humiliation. Jesus is naked, stripped by the soldiers. He is spit upon. Has that ever really happened to anybody? I, don't, don't raise your hand, but I want to tell you something. When I was a kid in school, two things would get me in a fight. You spit on me or you slap me and so help me. This was post being saved. But imagine the humiliation he was spit upon. He was taunted while they were mocking him. Taunting him to retaliate. And at one point, Jesus actually says, do you think that I do not at this very moment have access to 10,000 angels who would come to my assistance if I wanted to? At any moment, Jesus could have said, I've had it. That's it. And uh, legions of angels would have come and delivered and destroyed the planet righteously. But Jesus bore it all. This is why each of those places... He got slapped, beaten. They blindfolded him and struck him with rods. This whole time, blood is being shed as he's suffering. The humiliation, the taunting, and then the whipping post. And we saw some of that in this video. And every time I see it, it moves me to tears. How about you? It just, it just moves you to say, because we can, we can relate to the physical suffering. We can't fully relate to what it was that Jesus was taking on himself because as wicked and awful and horrible as the suffering was that he took physically, again, I don't, we can't really comprehend what it meant for him to experience the taking on of sin. But I want you to think about this. The whipping post really represented how our image, the image of God, was shattered by the things that we've experienced because of sin and Satan and his assault on God's beloved people. I meet with people every day whose lives 
have been shattered, whose image has been so broken and damaged by the things that they've experienced. And much of the world will walk right past them and say, tough rocks, that's your problem. But Jesus saw the wounds. He he saw the damage that was done. When I first read that King James Version where it says his visage was marred more than any man, that has stuck with me all my life. I read that when I was very young and I thought, what does that mean? That there were wounds upon him. In fact, Isaiah 53 verses 2 through 12 talk about that, that there were open wounds. Wounds were open for our transgressions, for our sin and our sins. The bruises that were under the skin. If you've ever had an a, a, a injury to a shin, have you ever, or stubbed a toe, there is nothing that can bring you closer to swearing than ha- stubbing your toe. All of you holy people have never experienced that. That's why I had to invent a whole bunch of Christian cuss words just for you. You better lighten up here, folks. Here we go. Wounds that are open and bruises, things that are under the skin. I want to tell you, that whipping post was Jesus saying that whatever you have experienced that has destroyed your personal identity, and if there's ever been a time in the history of our planet when there has been more and more distortion, perversion, and destruction of our identity and our image, it is what we're seeing now in a culture. And it's easy to point our finger and say, what is wrong with those people? How can they be so stupid? How can they be so deluded? Folks, we were all there had it not been for the grace of God. And we would be there now if it were not for the fact that he shed blood at that whipping post to restore to us what the enemy has stolen, what has been done to us through the damage of the buffeting of sin and the shame and the failures that we experienced because all of us, the Bible says, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Isaiah, and I'm just going to paraphrase this. It says, he bore our griefs. And by the way, that one of the verses in Isaiah 53 said, he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Always makes me think of that, oh brother, where art thou? That, never mind. <laughs> I am a man constant sorrows. This was Jesus. He was acquainted with grief. In fact, there are several words that are used to describe what he experienced through that beating that he took. And Isaiah 53 details it years before it happened. Griefs, the literal Hebrew word there for grief is sickness. He bore our sicknesses. The word sorrows has to do with pain. Our sicknesses and our pain. How many in this room have ever been sick? Yeah. How many are in pain? Yeah. What about rejection? Not only the rejection you felt from others, but what about the rejection that you have experienced with the self-hate that so many people live with? Having your own identity and your image of Christ so marred by sin that you can't even have respect for yourself. More things are happening to people today with suicides and self-hurt. All comes down to this thing of the enemy tricking you into believing that he has a way that works. And in the end, he turns everything against you. And not, not only do you not have any kind of comfort in yourself, but even yourself is against yourself. The blood shed at the scourging was Jesus saying, I'm going to restore everything that the enemy took from you and the image that I created in you. See, I want to tell you something. This is all the blood of Jesus all the way to the cross for our redemption. How many are making that connection? I hope you do. What about forsaken? Jesus experienced, at, when he was in the garden, he experienced the guys kept falling asleep. I tell you something, it's grievous when you want someone to come and pray with you and there's no one to pray with you. (laughs) Which makes me plug Wednesday night prayer meeting right now. (laughs) Everybody goes, oh, that was a dirty trick. But Jesus felt not only the rejection and abandonment by his disciples, 
Because the very night when they took him in the garden, it said then his, all of his disciples fled from him that night. But because he experienced all that, the Bible says this, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He has felt everything, experienced everything you and I have felt yet without sin. The crown of thorns, let me quickly move ahead here. The crown of thorns, what does that, what does that have to do with? It's not only the mockery that somehow the king of the Jews, as they put that thorn, thorny crown on his head and smote it till it poked through his eyebrows and into his skin. Anybody has a child that's ever stumbled against a coffee table and they get a little cut in their forehead, it bleeds like they're going to never stop bleeding. How many know what I'm talking about? So here he is, just the blood is pouring down his face. But it brought me to this that scripture in Genesis that says that because Adam sinned, he said, now the ground where you were originally going to have all this fruitfulness in the garden, now the garden or the, the, the soil will only give its fruitfulness through toil. And by the way, toil is not work. Toil is grievous, painful, unproductive, barely existing type of thing. And so there came with sin this, this thing that, that made what should be a fulfilling work into toil, grievous. But I thought immediately that the Bible says in Genesis 3.17, cursed is the ground. But then I thought about Galatians 3.13 that says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being a made curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. So he took all that which was designed to destroy us. And by the way, he didn't wipe out the need for work. He wiped out the idea of toil, to work for nothing, to feel absolutely like it's fruitless, futile, barren, purposelessness. But now because he has destroyed the curse of the law, those in Christ now find fulfillment in the things that the enemy wanted to make into arduous slave labor. Now, listen, I've worked in drywall for years, hanging sheetrock and sweating. I want to tell you something. It was hard work, but you know what? At the end of the day, I could stop and look back and go, I hung 50 sheets of board today. I have a good day. I didn't go home and say, I'm tired of building homes for the Pharaoh. <laughs> I'm actually working with a sense of fulfillment of what I'm doing. And I, I want to tell you something, that God wants to take believers out of the idea of toil, hopeless futility and barrenness, and say, listen, because what Jesus did... He has given us the opportunity now that everything we do can have a blessing attached to it because he was cursed for what cursed us. How many get that? Yes. If not, go ahead and toil. I don't want you to toil. I want you to realize that the fullness of what Jesus did. That crown of thorns highlighted the fact that Jesus is Lord over the things that cause us to feel so futile and barren. Now we know this, that I searched through the scriptures trying to find the exact scripture where it talked about them nailing him to the cross. You know, it's not there. Where we know that Jesus was nailed, first of all, because of history shows us crucifixion always involved the, uh, even though they would tie their hands, they would still, their, their, their hands and feet were nailed to the cross. We know that from when Thomas uh, comes into the room and won't believe that Jesus is resurrected. And he said, I won't believe until I put my fingers in the nail prints in his hands. And Jesus said, oh, oh, really? Okay, why don't you put your hands right there in the nail scar and thrust your hand to my side. Whew. I can hardly stand to look at my own wounds, let alone think it. Here he said, you think that what I did was that it wasn't me? This is me. This is me, the son of God, son of man, resurrected. Put your, you want to have your doubts removed? And suddenly Thomas realized, oh, my Lord and my God. You are the Christ. You are the resurrection one. John 14, 30 says this. Satan has come, but he has no part with me. This is before 
the crucifixion. Jesus knew he was going to face crucifixion. But he also knew that there was no way that Satan had a handle on him. There was no way that Satan had a handle on... You know, how many of us in this room have hang-ups? How many of us know there's places in our life where we can be easily triggered or where something that once was a part of our past could be the undoing of us presently if Satan could just get a handle on it? I don't care what it is. It could be addiction of any kind. It could be anger. It could be rage. It could be the, the desire to get back it could be rebellion it could be all kinds of things but Jesus said I'm going to the cross to accomplish a purpose and as I go I'm the perfect sacrifice and Satan has no handles on me he cannot stop and not only that but uh, Acts chapter 2 24 I believe it says that he cannot death itself could not hold Jesus because God raised him up having loosed the pains of death, and it was not possible for Jesus to be held down because Satan had no grip on him. I want to ask you something. Are there any places in your life where you say, man, I just feel so vulnerable at this area. I, I feel like if I just, uh, just one slight wrong move and I'm back in the hole where I came out of. Well, I want to promise you something. Every place that Jesus shed blood on that road of suffering said he shed blood at that point to give you the triumph and the victory over anything that the enemy ever had on you. How many of you have things in your memory, things in your past? The enemy keeps bringing it up and saying, well, you know, you, you will never be this because of that. Or you will never get the victory over this because of that. You've gone too far. You cannot be redeemed. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus died and redeems to the uttermost. He saves to the uttermost. There's nothing that you have done or can do that he has not paid the price for if you will come and accept what he has done through the shed blood of Jesus. I like the fact that while his feet were nailed, that there's a scripture in Genesis that says, it's verse three, uh, chapter three, verse 15, it says, the enemy, this was during the time when Jesus is dealing with the serpent, he says, you will bruise the heel of the woman, the seed of a woman. But that heel will crush your head. This was a prophecy. They call it the protoevangelism. The first evangelistic word ever spoken is that, yeah, Jesus would die and it appeared that he's wiped out. You know, when you're, when you're crucified, the greatest bruise on your body, other than where you've been beaten and nailed, is the heel of the one crucified is bruised because of the constant lifting back and forth because of the asphyxiation they're going through as the pectoral muscles and all the breathing apparatus begins to become exhausted and dehydrated. And now to even get a breath, you've got to lift up your... And so Jesus, in fact, had a bruised heel. But that bruised heel, when it touched ground, stood upon the head of the enemy and crushed his head. And it's still true today that Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. For this purpose was he manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. I know I'm going to jump off a little sideways here, but I have to say this. I love Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Jesus says to his disciples, this is before the cross. This is prophetic both then and after. He says, I give you power and authority to tread upon the serpent and the scorpion, and nothing and over all the power of the enemy, let me get that in, over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So, well, I've been hurt before. Ultimately, it means this. The enemy will never have the ultimate victory over, over you because Jesus established a once and for all victory, and he is bringing sons and, God, sons and daughters of God out of bondage into complete and total freedom. Every drop of blood was not wasted. And every drop of blood I will apply in my life to those times when I've, I'm struggling with my self-will. Jesus suffered so I could, I could do the will of God. I don't have to worry about the fact that my image has been tarnished so much by sin and my own failures that he says, I'm restoring to you the beauty of holiness. I'm making you in the image of Jesus. I'm making you all new again. The curse of sin has been destroyed. 
The nails and hands and feet have given you the authority to tread upon the serpent and scorpion. And the very last thing is where we read where it says that the soldiers came through to make sure that those who were hanging would, would be dead. And one of the ways that they would make sure that they would die was the traumatic pain comes for, that would come from the soldiers breaking the legs of the victim. But when they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead. And they pierced his side and blood and water flowed. And of course, you know what that speaks to. It speaks to the fact that Jesus on the cross gave birth to his church. And out of his side flowed blood and water. Think about it. Jesus birthed you and I as his living church from everything that he experienced on the cross, including when they cut through his side with that spear and blood and water flowed out. I want to tell you something, folks. This Christ is 100% covers every single thing that we would ever need. Every guilt and shame that you ever experienced, he wipes out. Every sickness and disease is available to you. Now, I know some will say, well, you know, what about my loved one? We prayed for them. They didn't get healed. I want to tell you something. We in this church know what that's like. We've had our loved ones, some of our dear, close friends here that got sick and died. My brother, who used to sit right back there and play piano, when he passed it, we prayed fervently for that he would be totally healed. But it didn't happen in his life. But guess what? He left this world and entered in another one where he was not the victim of cancer. <laughs> we had some dear folks who went through the, the Lou Gehrig's disease and we watched as it debilitated and tore apart that person's memory and their body. Yet in the moment that they went to glory, they went to glory in victory. <laughs> this is the one thing about this Christ is he takes you and I out of this world in victory. I believe in God's power to heal. I believe in God's power to deliver. But I also believe that anything I experience that doesn't work out like I expected or like I believe because I believe the Bible doesn't change the fact that God is still God. Jesus is still the healer. He is still the savior. He is still the deliverer. He is still the one who is King of kings and Lord of lords. They have mocked him with those crowns of thorns, but this day he is crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? <clears throat> Just begin to give thanks to the Lord right now, will you? If any of these things have connected, I hope they do. I, I, I prayed and I said, Lord, I... You put these things in my heart, so all I can do is trust that that you make them stick. I'm just a man who speaks. But Lord, it's your Holy Spirit and your word that goes deep into the heart and convicts and works the change that needs to happen in a life. I know there are people right now who you have contended for Let's just take one thing, for example. You've contended for healing, but you're still sick. There are some here that you have wanted so desperately to break free of the bondages and the things that have triggered you, where you'll go days or even months at a time and you'll be just doing fine. And then all of a sudden, bam, you're right back where you started. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus will meet you there. And I'll tell you right now, he will not give up on you. And he offers you an answer that will last, not just a temporary thing. But he says, if you come to me, I'll break that stronghold of death over your life. I'll break that addiction. I'll break that thing that wants to destroy your life. I'll restore you to all who you're all that you are supposed to be in the image of Almighty God. If that's you this morning, you say, Pastor, I, I just need God to restore something that's been torn in my life. Something has been destroyed. Something that's beat me down. And some of you who've had the accusations of the enemy come against you because of a failure. Every one of us in this room have failed at some point. And the, the enemy loves to come and point his finger right at the place. This is where you failed. And he, mo he mocks you as though you'll never, ever be able to forget that. Well, I'll tell you what. The thing that will remove all sin and shame 
is the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. With your head bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask this question real quickly here. If you're here this morning, say, Pastor, I, I need to apply that blood of Jesus. Just as we worship this morning, as we take of communion, I want to take the authority of the scriptures you've just shared and apply it to my life for the breaking of every bondage, the healing of every disease, the restoring everything lost. That's me this morning. I'm believing God for that. If that's you this morning, would you just lift your hand and say, that's me, Pastor. I, I, I want all of that. I want all of that. Yes, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I lift my hands this morning and say, Lord, any place where the enemy has is, is beaten me back and beaten me down, maybe I don't even recognize what's happened, but Lord, you have set me free. And I lay claim to that in Jesus' name. I lay claim to it now in Jesus' name. So as we conclude this morning, I want to say if you are here and you need prayer this morning, I'm going to ask you to be bold and come forward. And we'd like to pray for you. Pastor Randy and the elders here would be glad to come and pray with you. We'd like to just be available for any that would need a touch of God in your life this morning. Because the main event isn't that what we just did with the sermon. The main event is letting Jesus break bondages and for you to come into an intimate relationship with him. I really invite you, if you want prayer, listen, we all need to get tight with Jesus. We need to get into a place where he's doing some mighty things. So listen, I'm going to dismiss you in prayer, but I want to tell you, if you walk out that door and you have a need, that's on you because this morning Jesus is here to meet that need. Jesus is here to meet that need. We'd love to pray with you. So Father, right now, Right now, we just release the Holy Spirit to draw and to convince every heart this morning of your great love and your great care for them right now. Jesus, that you come this morning by your Spirit to forgive sin, to break bondages. Lord Jesus, to restore. This is our prayer. So Lord, we just release the body today. Those that must leave, we pray for your blessing upon them as they go. May they have a glorious day and week as we celebrate the resurrection season of our Lord. And we say in Jesus' name, be blessed. Amen. 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 You're free to go. And this morning, if you want prayer, please come. We'd love to